it's now on. Good afternoon, everyone. I uh, just want to express a welcome on behalf of Deloitte. Uh, my name is John Allred. I'm a managing director you know, here in our Salt Lake City practice. I work in our audit and assurance services uh, you know, business. Uh, I have with me two, two very intelligent individuals that I was grateful that could help and participate with us on this call today. Uh, the first I want to introduce, and, and as they get to their respective sections, I'll ask that they give a further introduction. But the first one is Jason Russell. Uh, Jason is a managing director. Uh, he works in our in our rewards consulting service in the Deloitte Tax Global Employer Services section of our firm. Uh, the other individual with me today is Morgan Miles. He is a senior manager in the Deloitte Accounting Advisory and Transformation business of ours. Uh, I thought it might be helpful for those of you that don't know about Deloitte and what we do. Uh, we are actually one of the largest professional, if not the largest professional services firm in the world. Uh, we have over 330 professionals across the globe. And we also have a strong practice locally here in Utah. Our Salt Lake City office has over 160 professionals and, and over 20 uh, partners and managing directors. We have all of our service lines locally here in Salt Lake, including audit, tax, consulting, and, and advisory services. Um, we, we would hope, and at the end of this presentation, we'll share some of our contact information so that if there's there's any questions that you have or want to reach out and, and have a chat with us, we'll, we'll provide all that information to you. Um, maybe before I kind of introduce the topics today, we were, we were kind of sitting back and thinking about what an interesting year this has been. It's been a challenging year uh, with, with COVID-19 and the pandemic. And, and that's actually brought up a few opportunities and, and, and different things to kind of think about from an accounting and tax perspective. And that's why we invited Jason and Morgan to kind of speak with us today. Um, so if maybe if J Jason, if you're, if you're ready, I'd like to kind of introduce Jason and let him kick off. He has a, a few a few thoughts on, on tax planning, especially in work from home environment. And then Morgan and I will have a discussion at the end around some of the recent accounting transactions and, and topics for the year. And, I, and hopefully these are helpful for everyone as they close out 2020 and look forward to 2021. So with that, Jason, I'll, I'll kick it over to you. All right, well, we're happy to be here with you this afternoon. And um, we have a little bit of uh, remote work discussions that we wanted to talk with you on this afternoon. If I can get my, there we go. Um, what we've run into with our clients over the last several months is their employees have gone from fully remote to partially remote to some of them back in the office. And now maybe they are remote again, but our clients have wrestled with what that means or what it should mean or what they should be doing about it, if anything, and what they want to do in 2021 that may be different than 2020. So there's been a lot of interesting conversations that we've had both domestically and globally. But as we sit here in December of 2020, I don't necessarily see a lot of consensus from companies about what they want to happen or what they're planning to happen. So we thought it was a relevant topic. Although anybody that touches payroll, December is typically a terrible idea to talk about anything new or different that we want to do for payroll. So if it's easier or more palatable to think about this as a 2021 planning idea, then we're certainly okay with that instead. But we don't think that it's too late to take actions for 2020. Your employees have probably not spent a lot of time thinking about their individual tax picture for calendar 2020 yet, although as we slide into the December holidays and they take some unplugged time, then they will think more about it. And we'd like for your internal teams to get ahead of that so they don't come back from the holidays or get bombarded with a bunch of questions that the employees may be going down the wrong path. Mostly though, we wanted our clients uh, to understand that remote work is on a lot of people's minds. And on this slide, which is a little busy, I know, you know, a lot of companies have understood it, lived through it. They feel that it's been successful. And when we get post pandemic, they believe that it's gonna be here to stay in some capacity. So what was believed to be a stopgap and an emergency measure to get every company through the pandemic so that they wouldn't have to shut their doors. Now they understand that it's gonna become part of company culture. And while no one really believes that offices are going away, 
the idea that offices at capacity with a working style like existed as late as the end of calendar 2019 might not be a reality in really any industry going forward. And with that comes a fair number of some practical challenges. But there's been a difference in what the actual workers think and what the employers think about it. You know, on the left side of this slide, we see that while company, uh, while the employees feel that they've been successful, and while the employees feel that they could continue to be successful, and while employees think that they've been not less productive than in the office, employers are slowly catching up. Although really, if you read the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times or any business media, it feels like that changes on a week to week basis. For us, the encouraging sign is for those of us that believe that work from home has had a, a measure of success, that by and large companies on an industry agnostic basis do feel that this has worked. And while definitely there will be a return to work philosophy, it doesn't look like it's gonna be that everyone has to return to work. And that's where we get into, okay, then what does that mean? So where companies are is somewhere on this spectrum here. What we've seen is that some of our very smallest companies, certainly pre-public, maybe the ones that had a degree of financial insecurity already, they tended to have jettisoned their offices wholesale and they moved to a virtual model if they weren't already there and they've embraced it whether or not they loved it because they needed to as a cost savings measure. We have other companies that are in the process of doing remote work now. They are penciling in a strategy that will apply both in the remainder of this pandemic and will serve them going forward. We have other companies that feel very much that in the third category, they are taking stopgap measures to get them through the pandemic but are taking a thoughtful approach about what remote work looks like into, let's call it perpetuity or in post pandemic. And while they don't expect that post pandemic looks like the reality today, they do expect for remote work to have some place. And then finally, there are companies that are ignoring the reality of right now because they do think it's an emergency. They're slow walking their idea of what they want remote work to be moving forward. And maybe they're gonna think about it in the future and maybe they're not. On this slide here and on the next couple, you know, as tax practitioners, we get asked a lot about the dollars and cents that are behind the idea of remote work. What we wanna make sure of is that a company thinks holistically about all the issues that are back there. Because as we've helped companies pinpoint what happens if worker A goes from country X to country Y, or state B to state C, or what we've realistically seen from state D to E to F to G and back again to state B, all within the same calendar year, or is planning a trip from country G to H to I to J that would spread through most of 2021, there's a ton of issues that are sitting out there that relate to nothing that sits in the tax field. And companies that might think that from an employee experience perspective are things they want to green light are running into a host of issues around their data security, around their insurance, around immigration and the right to work that their business units didn't necessarily think to take on when they thought about, well, could this employee work remote and could we exist on a laptop video screen and still get a project done? As far as, you know, marrying the idea from an on-site to a remote strategy, the discussions that we've had so far are mostly around the collaboration aspect. And then certainly from a tax compensation perspective, what does geolocated compensation look like as an entry point to the discussion? Now, as a tax practitioner in the compensation space, what I find interesting is I don't see many companies yet that are taking a strong and voluble stand on the idea of geolocated compensation. While many companies are not saying 
you must plan to return to work in the office that we hired you at some point in 2021. At the same time, they're also not saying, and we will plan to mirror your compensation level to where your feet are on the ground working if you choose to stay there once we are in post-pandemic. A lot of companies are taking a, let's call it a wait and see, which is very interesting for a company that incubated a workforce on a coastal city, which is fairly expensive, and has seen a migration of those high cost jurisdiction workers to lower cost jurisdictions that are more in the center of the country or certainly away from metropolitan areas. While you already had planned and headcount for those individuals to be here and working, the impact of that on recruiting in subsequent cycles will be interesting because a coastal developed population and the expectation for salaries for somebody who plans to live well inland where the cost of living could be 30 to 40% less will be a very interesting compensation strategy for companies to think about going forward. I would still say, I would think that most companies are still in the mindset as we talk to them every day in December they don't think that they've figured this out. I have very few clients who think that we know what we want the answer to be in post-pandemic perpetuity, but they are starting to trickle out policies that can be the new normal, at least for 2021. And they're all over the spectrum as far as what is permissible for remote, what is permissible for on-site, and what is going to be a blend of both. And those policies take the spectrum of we're a smaller company and we're not present in many jurisdictions. You may be able to be working in a jurisdiction where we are already present, but we're not willing to take on new jurisdictions. Or we're a large company, we're basically present everywhere, but we don't want to facilitate the movement of your body through space through our internal systems. We may permit some temporary relocations for your work site throughout the year, but we are not going to permit a nomadic existence because we don't have the internal bandwidth to do that if it's not a business-driven move. And so other companies have said, we want to promote a positive employee experience. Generally speaking, the world is your oyster. Now, whenever you hear a company that has a policy like that and says, we permit remote work, there very often is a substantial caveat that says, if you're a US-based employee, you can work remotely in the country that you were hired. If you're an employee who was hired outside the US, you can often work within the EU. And otherwise you're back to thinking that you can work within the country that you were hired with some exceptions for occasional forays, depending on if the company has a business entity outside the country, if there's a treaty, you know, there's always an asterisk and a caveat, Um, which gets into, you know, what's the best blend of how could we achieve employee wishes to be mobile and employee wishes to be somewhere else with the desire of a company to We still have to get work done and we need to not spend a substantial amount of time on letting employees just constantly move through space and let that be a drain on internal admin. We want employees to be happy here, but we don't want to always treat them as if they're a new hire. Which brings us back to what we really wanted to focus on in this module here at the beginning, which is the tax compliance. Now, the piece of the tax world that I focused on is, quite frankly, the second box on this slide, which is the employment tax. In U.S. terms, if you don't have employees working in a jurisdiction, mostly on a state basis, and all of a sudden in the pandemic, you have employees who have shown up there and are active employees working, that needs to be a registration that the company makes to tell the state that we have employees boots on the ground working in this jurisdiction. It's a pretty simple process. It doesn't mean that you're registered there in perpetuity. If you have an employee who leaves, you can deregister and the workforce changes. That's a pretty common practice. What companies have run into is 
it's an annoying one-time practice. They didn't necessarily want to chase their employees and they don't actually know where their employees all are. Because as we've all been working from home, everybody simply exists on a laptop screen with virtual backgrounds and not really tracking people through VPN. No one is really confident of where anybody is. And the idea of asking is something that companies have felt invasive about. Absent a pandemic, you know where your employees are because you asked them to go there, which means you have business traveler data. And if you didn't ask them to go there, they're either on vacation or they're at the office. And if they're on vacation, you treat them as if they're in the office. But in a pandemic, when you said work where you feel safe, employees have drifted to every state in the country and no one really has a handle on that. So there's starting to be a sense of do I have a withholding obligation in a state that I'm not currently undertaking? So to use an example here, am I a California-based company with California-based employees? Did I have employees who fled back in March to Salt Lake, to Park City, to somewhere in Moab, in Utah, where there were fewer people, or maybe they had family, where the standard of living was much higher than the Bay Area or Los Angeles? If so, for my California-based company, I may not have had a presence in Utah, and now all of a sudden I have 100 employees in Utah. Do I need to register? The technical correct answer to that is yes. You should be withholding Utah taxes for those formerly California-based employees. The question about whether you should still pay California taxes depends on whether they evacuated, meaning they still have a home in California to go back to, or whether they relocated, meaning they took all their stuff with them, broke a lease, sold a house, and now they're permanently in Utah. If they simply evacuated, they just left their apartment behind, they'll go get it later when the pandemic is over, they're still a California resident. So the technically correct answer that not many companies are doing yet is we would pay Utah taxes for all the days that an employee is working in Utah, and you would pay the California rate differential, which is about 5%, that you didn't already pay to Utah for your California residents who are spending time in Utah. For a California former California employee who has instead relocated, taken all their stuff, broken a lease, you arguably wouldn't owe taxes to California. And this is now a Utah-based employee. And what we've seen is that companies don't have a handle. They don't even know their employees are in Utah. They don't know who broke a lease. They're not even sure who is where. They're starting to figure that out. So we are here in December and we have companies starting to feel uneasy and they wanna let employees know this may continue into most of 2021, what should they do? So if I register in Utah, continuing my example, I may get some interest from the state of Utah about sales and use taxes, corporate taxes, all kinds of other interests from the state just because I have employees there temporarily. Did we get any relief because of COVID, because of pandemics? We got some. The guidance that we tended to get from state governments tended to address corporate taxes, basically things that were not payroll related. And states have tried to work hard to say, if you didn't already have clients, if you didn't have an office, if you just have employees who are temporarily there, we're gonna try to work hard to not find nexus and not make you pay taxes here, but that doesn't have anything to do with payroll. If you have feet on the ground working active employees in a state, you tend to still have a withholding obligation. But to go back to my example, do your employees care? For my California-based employees who simply evacuated, still have an apartment, will go back to it eventually, they're not saving any taxes. When they go to Utah, instead of paying 9.3% to California, what they really should be paying, 5% to Utah, 4.3% to California. They're still paying the total 9.3%, now they're just paying at two different places. What employees think happen is once they're not working in California, they don't owe California anything. So they think that they're only paying Utah 5% or realistically, if they're in Nevada or Texas or Florida or Washington state, they think they're paying no state income taxes and they're forgetting they still have a home back in California. So part of this is employee education Part of this is explaining what you want the company policy to be. And part of this is understanding where are the employees actually right now? What we've suggested is you need to figure out what your policy is. And we get that you have 
one and a half payrolls left in 2020, you have the ability as companies to make decisions up until December 31st. After that, it's really gonna be on the employees to make their filing decisions. We think that what companies should do is they should communicate carefully what their policy is going to be for 2020, for what happened during the pandemic, so that your employees are not surprised. If you are rolling out a policy in calendar 2021, it's okay if it's different. So much is gonna be different. But it's a good idea to communicate with your employees for what you are going to allow and what you're not going to allow. And definitely you wanna get ahead of the reporting season. Because in my California, Utah example, if you are not making changes and you're assuming everybody was at work, the entire year and they were all at work in California, I would mentally prepare your employees for that. So that if they want to file a Utah return, great, that's gonna be up to them. You may need to be prepared if they come back and get some state notices, they may want some help from you adjusting some W-2s, but that's for down the road. Mostly though, help your employees understand what is going to happen and what's not going to happen. And then what is going to be your strategy going forward into 2021 and maybe into perpetuity? That is something that we hope doesn't get decided in a vacuum. Payroll won't make decisions by itself. Payroll will make decisions with human resources, with compensation, sometimes with stock administration, certainly with tax and finance channels. Those teams need to make a working group together. Figure out who's going to be in charge, what is the company's policy going to be? Do you need people to be within a commutable distance, but never in the office? Do you need people to be in the office every day, but maybe can work from home one day a week? Do you care if people never come to the office? Are you gonna to turn to a hot desk or hoteling model? Again, I don't see people that are making permanent decisions right now. I see people still making longer term pandemic decisions and they're using what they observe during the pandemic to decide what their permanent policy is gonna be. I don't see permanent policies applying to every department. You can certainly have some departments that are allowed to be remote, other departments that must be in the office. For example, if you have a lab, the lab employees need to be in the office. If you have other departments that wanna be in the office, make them be in the office. Mostly though, it's time to start communicating with employees. I have some companies that have said, we're taking a wait and see approach. It doesn't play well. And I'm starting to see employees shift employment. There are jobs, everybody's working at home. They can work on their couch from this company over here, just as well as they can work for your company right here. So the more that you communicate, even if the answer is, we don't know, but we're working on this, the better we think that this is. Um, we also think that the more stakeholders that you involve, not that you want a complete Tower of Babel, but the more people that are involved in coming to a true holistic answer, the better it will be. And then finally, the last one that I'll leave is for whatever policy that you decide, think about hardening your country borders. The, the idea that employees can move around within a country, it's pretty easy and the compliance is pretty nominal. Once you permit employees to cross borders, the US to Canada, lots of travel within Europe, certainly traveling within and across Asia or from the US to Asia, the US to the EU, the EU to the US, this gets monumentally more complicated. And the risk factors to the company from a corporate tax perspective, from immigration, from a withholding, they get much, much bigger. So with that, I think I'm gonna relinquish the microphone uh, I really appreciate my time in this session today. And if there are questions, we'll watch the chat feature and answer them nearer the end. Thank you, Jason. Uh, th this is Morgan Miles. Uh, John mentioned I'm a senior manager in our accounting advisory and transformation services group. I'm actually based out of, of Boston now. I spent the first seven years of my career in Salt Lake City and then uh, did, did a, a few years in our national office in Connecticut and then landed up here in Boston. So historically, I have an audit background, but uh, for the last 18 months, just been doing work on the advisory side, mainly in uh, capital markets readiness, you know, given the 
the surge in activity we've seen with companies entering capital markets, either through IPOs or SPACs, and then also just a lot of you know on, ongoing technical accounting on-call questions. Uh, so it's always good to be uh, to be involved back with the Silicon Slope scene. And today we've tried to tailor our remarks around you know updates that are going to be relevant for the audience. You know, particular focus on private, public technology companies. And so with that, if we could go ahead and advance to the next slide. So really the, the goal of my remarks is to, to, to give some context around what the FASB has been up to recently. Um, now, from a high level, there's nothing, there's no large standard either in the works or on the horizon. You know, it was clear after, after the FASB rolled out a new revenue standard, leasing standard, and a new impairment standard within a relatively short period, there was definitely some preparer fatigue. And so the, the FASB has very much taken a, a different approach and is looking to do targeted improvements and simplification projects. And so, you know, some of the items I wanted to point out on this current slide relate to recent FASB meetings. Uh, one of those that I think will, you know, you'll come up against in in your operations is dealing with modifications of freestanding options. You know, commonly you see this with issuance of warrants. Uh, it could be warrants issued uh, to an investor or maybe to a creditor. And right now in GAAP, there is no framework that tells you how to account for those when you modify those arrangements. And so this project was actually given to the EITF and the EITF's current proposed framework would have you look at the modification as effectively exchanging a new warrant for an old warrant. And it, it's similar to what you do under stock-based compensation model that to the extent that you have given incremental value that you need to recognize that, that incremental value. But then what's unique about this standard or this proposed standard is you then need to look at the counterparty to which you're giving that incremental value. If it's a creditor, then it's gonna be presented as a debt issuance cost. If it's an equity holder and it's part of an equity issuance transaction, then you would present that as a reduction to equity. Now, if it's an employee or maybe a uh, non-employee service provider that has a share-based award and you've given them that in the form of a warrant, then you could present that as additional compensation expense. Now, if none of those frameworks are applicable and you just gave extra value to a counterparty and nothing was received in exchange, then it would be recorded as a dividend. Um, so we should expect to see that the EITF continue to work through that and, and, and uh, issue a standard probably within the near future. Also of note on this slide was a public roundtable that the FASB did, I wanna say in September on leases. And really what the purpose of this was, is to do a review uh, with stakeholders on some of the significant areas that were challenging upon implementation of the leasing standard. And you know, some of the, uh, some of the common areas that, that I see the most in practice and not surprising you know, made it to the agenda was how to deal with the incremental borrowing rate. Um, now, if you are a private company, there's, a, there's an expedient that allows you just to use a risk-free rate and you kind of just set it and forget it. But if you're a public company, you can't apply that. And this has been pretty costly for companies to do in practice because they've had to go out and find a proxy um, to understand what an incremental borrowing rate would be for them and make sure that that aligns with the term and for the amount that they're getting under the lease. And it's just a really expensive process for them. So they thought about adding a similar expedient for public companies, but ultimately people agreed not to. And you'll see that that's kind of a similar theme with everything that was talked about at this round table. They acknowledge that embedded leases um, are, are becoming more problematic than expected. They're, they're popping up in supply agreements. And so there, again, there was a discussion of, well, should we modify the standard to remove these? And ultimately they landed on, no, we're not gonna change the standard. Um, also, there's issues related to allocation of fixed and variable payments to lease and non-lease components. And again, the FASB is not going to change anything here because the view is, well, we get that it can be challenging if you have lease and non-lease components, but that's why we gave the practical expedient to combine those as one combined lease component. And it sounds like that's what companies are mostly doing in practice. 
So that problem has kind of taken care of itself. So out of all these items, the only one that we expect the FASB to pick up and address on an ongoing basis is what to do around the leaf, lease modification model and if that can be simplified. Uh, so if we can go to the next slide. Okay, so a couple of recent accounting standards that have been issued. Uh, one of them relates to deferring the revenue standard and the lease standard for certain entities. Now this only applies to private companies um, and then some not-for-profit organizations, but effectively this came out right really when the pandemic was starting. And it was at the timing when a lot of private companies were going through the process of adopting the new revenue standard. And so the FASB came out and what they did is they pushed that out another year for companies to use at their option. Um, so, you know, if you're a private company, you, you now technically don't have to adopt ASC 606 until this period in, in 2020. And for leasing, that was actually pushed out two years. So private companies on the original adoption timeline, it was required for 2020 this year, but that's now been pushed out to for a calendar year reporting companies January 1 of 2022. So some relief that the FASBs provided. Um, that's one standard I wanted to point out that the next one relates to simplifying the accounting for uh, convertible debt. So the current model for convertible debt is overly complex because there's there are five different models that a convertible debt instrument can fall within. And this continues to be an area of misstatements or for public companies, an area where the SEC uh, tends to comment on just because of the complexity in this area. And so what this model is doing is, re is removing two of those models. So, so now we're just left with three. Now the, the two that were eliminated, one is the concept of whether a convertible instrument has a beneficial conversion feature. That's effectively when you issue a convertible instrument where on day one, it's, it's in the money meaning the fair value of the underlying common shares into which it's convertible is in excess of the exercise price. That's, that's currently a, a very complex model in US GAAP. That's being done away with. And, and so is the, uh, the cash conversion guidance where, and this is very common for, I would say mid cap public companies, you know, that have recently become, that have recently IPO'd and are look, looking for additional funding. This has been a very popular vehicle because you can get a lot of funding at a low interest rate um, in exchange for giving the investor some potential upside through a conversion feature. Uh, under current gap, you had to split those out between debt and equity. It created a lot of non-cash interest expense, um, had some valuation complexities and costs. That model's going away. So unless, unless the conversion feature has to be bifurcated as, a, as an embedded derivative, everything's just gonna go on as debt. So really, if you take a step back, what the FASB is doing with these is really limiting the scenarios where you're going to split convertible debt between debt and equity on day one. Um, let's see if we can go to the next slide, please. So as far as proposed ASUs that are coming up, um, one of them is on, I'll, I'll just touch on the first one, stock-based compensation. This is specific for private companies. So what the FASB is doing with this is they're providing a practical expedient right. um, for an, an, an easy way to measure share-based awards. So currently the standard requires that you have to understand what the fair value of, of the underlying share is. Now, a lot of private companies will get 409A valuation reports, which um, gives, which you know states what the fair value of that common stock is. Mm -hmm. This is basically codifying in GAAP to acknowledge that private companies can use that fair value as a practical expedient. Now, the reality is in practice, that's already been done and auditors just then have to get their arms around that 409A to make sure it's representative of what fair value is, but at least it's being codified now. Um, now, if we move on to the next slide, this is uh, some other projects that are very, very uh, early stages ongoing, relates to subsequent accounting for goodwill. Um, also, there's some related to identifiable and tangible assets, but, but the biggest piece here is, is goodwill. Uh, this, is, this should be pretty big interest for public companies because the accounting for goodwill is costly and complex. Um, now, you know, once you acquire a company and that goodwill comes on your books, 
then every reporting period thereafter, it's, it's a valuation exercise to support that that amount is not impaired. Uh, it's, it's very expensive for both the preparers and the auditors. Now, for private companies, there's currently um, an alternative that you can just amortize that over 10 years. So that's really kind of the direction this appears to be heading. Whether that's going to be 10 years or not, I, I don't know. But it, it's good to see that it's being discussed and that the FASB is thinking about it. I also wanted to note a couple of other recent changes that aren't on this slide. The, the accounting for asset acquisitions and how that could be aligned with business combinations is being revisited. Um, now, what's interesting is the FASB decided to drop how in-process research and development should be accounted for. Um, so currently, if, if you're in an asset acquisition and you acquire IPR&D, that's expensed. Whereas if it's, if it's a business combination, it's capitalized. Now, with the change in the definition of a business, I want to say three, four years ago, we're seeing more and more asset acquisitions that used to be business combinations. And especially in, in the tech space, a lot of these acquisitions may involve the acquisition of IPR&D if the, if the target is an early stage entity. So that, that difference between asset acquisition and purchase accounting may continue to exist. Um, the last thing I'll note is this is actually just today, the FASB just released a proposed ASU that clarifies how when companies acquire, when, when, they, when, they, have a, when they have purchase accounting under ASC 805, there's now proposed amendments on how the acquirer should deal with deferred revenue. So if we think historically, um, if a company had deferred, if a target had deferred revenue on their books, the acquirer had to fair value that. And the fair value was typically much lower than the carrying value because you would just value what the remaining legal obligation was. And what that resulted in is a lot of that revenue was lost in the future because you had to take a haircut at the time of the purchase accounting rather than just continue to amortize that deferred revenue balance into revenue on a prospective basis. So what the FASB has proposed is that under, under the purchase accounting guidance in 805, that deferred revenue or you know, contract liability as it's called under ASC 606, that there's gonna be a measurement exception. So rather than having to apply fair value, um, ASC 805 would then just tell you that in order to measure what that contract liability should be, you should then reference over to the revenue standard. So effectively, what, what the standard's getting at is that contract liability should really be the same on the purchaser's books as it was on the seller's books and that you shouldn't take a large haircut at the time of the transaction. So that should solve or help to solve some of the practice issues that we're currently seeing, especially about revenue kind of being lost in, in the purchase accounting. Um, so anyway, that's kind of a, a, a flavor of some of the you know, current changes. They're all in, you know, different areas of progress along the FASB spectrum. Um, and these are all areas that, that we think are, are relevant to, to those that are gonna be participating in this, uh, in, in this uh, session. So, you know, if there's any questions, anything further you'd like to discuss, you know, I'm happy to discuss and please feel free to reach out. And with that, I'm gonna turn the time over to my colleague, John. Thanks, Morgan. Really appreciate it. And thanks for providing some updates. The, the focus of the next few minutes from my side will be, uh, you know, th thinking through some of the events and, and impacts of COVID-19 and some of the FASB relief um, that has been put out there, you know, related to each one of those. I'm going to spend a little time talking about FASB relief for leases, uh, talk a little bit about, about a, how to account for PPP loans, and also touch a little bit on debt modifications. Um, so, with that, what, what we're seeing is in, in the marketplace is, is several entities have sought out and, and sought out concessions on their leases, you know, as they think about their, uh, you know, not operating at the fullest extent, revenues down, and, and we're seeing a lot of those concessions being granted. So the question becomes then, how do I account for that concession? Under the normal gap, some of the difficulty is, is that's normally treated and run through a modification model. And that modification model can be very, uh, difficult, oftentimes it's legal intensive. And, and as we think about a company that might have many different leases, it can be very, very time intensive and expensive to do that. And so because of that, the, the FASB issued a relief where they say, well, because of this, and we'll kind of walk through who this applies to, you can effectively say, I will 
simply make an election to either apply the modification guidance or to treat the concession as if it were available under the normal terms and conditions of the original lease. And in a moment, I'll kind of walk through what those are, but maybe to kind of level set, the, the general types of concessions we're seeing out there is, is really first from a rent forgiveness. This is where the total lease payments over the life of the lease have decreased. Another one might be there's a period of rent deferral to say, hey, you know, you don't have to pay me for this period, but we're gonna make up those lease payments on the back end. And then we see a mixture sometimes of, of both of those. And so who this applies to and kind of think through whether you can apply the guidance and the relief that the FASB has put out there is, is really that the, the concession must be related to the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. So if it has nothing to do, if the concession is outside that concept, then you wouldn't be able to apply this guidance. And then it also, the other filter to think through is it also must result in total payments that are less than or equal to the original lease payment or the original lease terms. Uh, and, and, and to be clear that this, uh, this guidance applies both to lessees, it also applies to lessors, and it's also applicable under the 840 model and the 842 model. Um, and another thing to think about, even if, so this, this relief was published in, I think, April, early May. So even if the concession were granted before that became effective, you can still apply this relief. Uh, and, and it will extend for a period of time. So as long as the concession meets those two criteria, then you can apply it. Um, maybe a, th a few things to kind of think of what it does not apply to, which I think is helpful, is if this is a, a modification to the agreement where you're actually changing the underlying leased asset, uh, you cannot apply the guidance or this relief package to it. Also, if, if, you, if, if you have simply made short or shorted payments under the lease and no contractual changes have actually happened to the lease arrangement, then you would also not be able to apply this, this payment. Um, maybe one thing to kind of think through is an, an extended lease term maybe, maybe in and maybe applies, but it would only apply if you've also reduced the total cash flows or they're equal to the original uh, term of the lease. So let's talk a little bit, I'd like to spend a little bit of time on this slide of what does this actually look like? And so we've, we've shown an example here of how you might apply the guidance. There are three, generally three acceptable approaches here. Uh, one is called the payable, the other is the contingency resolution approach and the other is a variable lease expense approach. Each of these would have very different uh, results on your financial statement. And this slide is intended to kind of lay out what that would look like. And so under the payable approach, and by the way, this, this example here applies to a lessee where the, the rent was simply deferred and not uh, reduced overall. And so under the payable approach, you would not need to go in and remeasure the, the ROU asset or liability. The expense recognition wouldn't change. You also would not change your lease liability. So as the payments come due, you would effectively, rather than paying the cash, so if you're deferring the rent payment, you would effectively reduce your, your, uh, your liability. Uh, you would amortize your asset as you would normally do, but then that payment would then effectively move over to a payable. And then that payable would sit there and then reduce as you catch up with payments. Uh, the other acceptable approach is the contingency resolution approach. So this would result in a, an actual remeasure of the lease liability and ROU asset. Now you might look at that and say, well, hey, if I'm not applying the the contingency guidance, this seems rather onerous. Now, to be fair, this would still be considered a relief because you would not have to go through and actually prove that it's a modification or not. You could simply elect it. Um, th this is often a, uh, preferable for those entities where they've actually had an overall reduction in the lease payments, because this allows you then to reset the asset, reset the liability. And under this approach, uh, that resetting of the liability would actually just run through the asset balance. So there'd be no day one PL impact. Um, however, inherently, since the lease payment terms have changed, then your lease expense going forward would be different. And then the final one is a variable lease expense approach. This one I find the most interesting. Uh, you would effectively treat the concession as a reduction uh, of the lease liability uh, in the period, well, sorry, of the expense in the period in which you don't pay it. And so you effectively treat all lease expense as variable lease expense. And so in the period in which rent is deferred, uh, you would actually have a very low rent amount. But when you then had to pay that amount in a later period, 
the rent expense would go up. So this would cause quite a, quite a bit of, of variability in the lease expense recognition. Uh, we have a really good heads up. And, and if, if, you know, if you're not familiar with the Deloitte heads up, you'll see there's a link here. If you simply Google heads up, you will find the, you know, Deloitte heads up. We issued one in April. It was updated in, in April 30th, and it provides some very good examples of how to, to practically, you know, apply this guidance. And then moving on to PPP loans. Now, th th this is interesting. So first, some companies who receive PPP loans in excess of 2 million uh, found they were not able to make good faith certification regarding the economic need for the loan. You know, specifically those with large market caps and they have good access to credit markets. Those entities were actually permitted in May uh, to repay the loan and redeem to have met the economic need certification in good faith. Uh, for all the others that received the PPP loan in excess of 2 million, uh, the application of the criteria and whether you qualified for the need will actually be reviewed for each of those loans. And that's part of the application of the, for, the application for their forgiveness process. And, and the reason I highlight this is important is really, it's twofold. So first, uh, the economic consequence of meeting the forgiveness criteria is obvious. You know, the loan may need to be repaid, which, which may not be a good outcome if it's unexpected. But second, the accounting model used and the pattern of recognition of any income relating to the debt forgiveness actually may depend on the company's assessment of the likelihood of attaining, attaining forgiveness. So there's really kind of two, there, there's two acceptable models viewed. And, and the first is to treat the, the actual PP loan as debt. And, and that's always going to be viewed as acceptable because the PPP loan is an in legal form debt. So if you think about treating it as debt, when you obtain the loan, it goes on the balance sheet. You would need to think through classification of repayment terms. Um, it would also be a financing activity as it relates to the borrowings. Any payments would go through that. There would be interest expense associated. Uh, with this one though, so when you did obtain forgiveness, if that happens, you would account for that um, as an extinguishment of debt in the period in which it is legally extinguished. And that's the key criteria is to make sure it is legally extinguished, you know, either through notification by the bank or the small business association. Um, the other acceptable format is the government grant format. However, this one oftentimes is very challenging. And as I mentioned before, and as you'll see in the third bullet, is all loans in excess of $2 million will go through an evaluation of whether you actually met the economic criteria on the onset. And so therefore, whether it's even eligible uh, for forgiveness often be, it becomes challenging. And, and it's difficult to conclude that you'll meet that until um, that review actually happens. And so therefore, under the grant model, you would effectively, uh, you know, recognize this as a reduction of the related, uh, you know, offsetting the related expense to which it's intended to, to pertain. Um, but, but then the challenge is you, it may be difficult to actually conclude it's likely that you'll receive forgiveness for those factors I outlined. And so therefore, you know, most of the entities we see are concluding that it's, it's treated as debt, they reflect it as such, and then they're, they will you know, go through the evaluation of the period in which it's forgiven. Uh, also to maybe just think through the balance sheet, I kind of touched on, on that a little bit, but also important, whatever that decision is and that's made, make sure you're comfortable with your auditors and you know, seek out advice from others. But, but it's important to make sure you're disclosing that accounting policy and the treatment of that uh, within, within the financial statements. That way a reader has a clear understanding of, of what you did and why. So maybe just uh, one other thing to kind of highlight as we're kind of uh, bunching up on time is I, maybe I'll just talk a little bit about modifications to debt agreements. That's another impact we're seeing is due to COVID, uh, oftentimes we're seeing amendments not only for you know, payment terms, we're also seeing those happening for um, covenants and so forth. Uh, just remember as you're thinking through the year and closing out the books, any amendments that you, that you have need to run, be run through uh, the model for to determine whether it's first a trouble debt restructuring or whether it's a, a modification or whether it's a, a completely new agreement in substance and you would treat it as an extinguishment and, and putting that back on the books. Um, so with that, I, I, we want to leave a little bit of time to allow individuals that are you know listening in on the call to ask some questions. Maybe what I can do is I'll, I kind of want to come to the end and I'm going to zoom through these pretty quickly. I just wanted to put our names and contact information up on the screen. 
you know, if, if there's any questions that want to happen after this call, please feel free to reach out to any of us. Uh, here are our email addresses. We'd love to chat with you, get to know you. you know, if there's any specifics, we'd be happy to do that. But maybe with that, I'll, I'll pause for a moment and see if there's any questions coming through live. I'm not hearing any. So if that's the case, then uh, it was great, great to connect with everyone virtually today. Uh, please reach out if you have any questions. We'd love to uh, get to know you and help you out in any way we can. Thank you. Uh, and, and also thanks to Morgan and to Jason for all their help on the call today.